On January 2nd, 1800, three men stood around New York's Manhattan Well. They were dragging the well with long poles. Within moments, they found and recovered the battered body of Julie Elma Sands, who was 22 years old and at that point had been missing for 11 days. Shortly thereafter, a man named Levi Weeks, who was said to be Julie Elma's fiancé, was arrested for the crime of murder. And in the trial that followed, he was defended by not just one, but three of the most prominent attorneys in New York City at the time. Former Treasury Secretary Alexander Hamilton, soon to be Vice President of the United States Aaron Burr, and future Supreme Court Justice Brockholz Livingston. The story of the murder of Julie Elma Sands and the Manhattan Well murder trial, the first murder trial in the United States for which we have a written transcript, is history that deserves to be remembered. Levi Weeks was 24 years old when he was arrested for Julie Elma's murder. He was the brother of Ezra Weeks, one of the most successful builders in New York City in 1800. At the time of the trial, the Weeks brothers were building Alexander Hamilton's estate, the Grange. Just a year before, the Weeks had finished building the Gracie Mansion, now the official residence of the mayor of New York City. In December of 1799, he was living at the boarding house of the Quakers Catherine and Elias Ring. Julie Elma Sands, whom her friends called Elma, was 22 years old in 1799 and also lived at the Ring's boarding house. Catherine was her cousin. For several months, she had been openly courted by Levi, and on December 22nd, she told her cousin, that they were to be secretly wed that night. What happened next would be the question around one of the very first sensational and well-covered trials in the United States. According to Catherine Ring, Levi Weeks came down into the living room around 8 o'clock. Later, she heard someone else come down, whom she assumed to be Elma, and after a few moments of whispering, she heard them both leave. Elma would never return. Her body was discovered in the Manhattan Well in Lisbonard Meadows on January 2nd, 1800. A few days after a child had discovered Elma's muff, a cylinder of fabric for her hands there. Her body seemed to have been beaten and her clothes were torn in several places. The suspicion naturally fell on her alleged fiancé. Elma's body was brought to the ring's boarding house where hundreds of people came to see it. When the crowds became too great, the casket was displayed on the street, guarded by her family and friends. Richard Croucher, an acquaintance and frequent visitor to the boarding house, made himself conspicuous in declaring Levi's guilt and spreading rumors that a man in Rhode Island had confessed to being an accomplice. He may even have been involved in printing handbills condemning Levi. Whatever his involvement, public sentiment against Levi Weeks was overwhelmingly negative. The New York Gazette and general advisor said Elma had expected to be married, but little did she expect that the arrangements she had been making would direct her to that bourne from which no traveler returns. Soon she was said to have been pregnant and killed wearing her wedding dress. Levi himself was not wealthy, but he worked closely with his brother Ezra, who was well connected. It was Ezra who enlisted the crack legal defense team of Burr, Hamilton, and Livingston. All three were also active in the contentious election season of 1800, Burr and Livingston in support of Jefferson and Hamilton in support of the Federalists, and so may have welcomed the publicity. But even these talented lawyers had little experience in criminal court. The American justice system in 1800 bore only a faint resemblance to the one that we know today. English common law, upon which the nation to American judicial system was largely based, gave few protections to the accused. England didn't even guarantee the right to representation in a felony trial until 1836, and this arrangement meant that very few lawyers in the United States had any experience defending in criminal cases. They didn't defend in misdemeanor trials either, as most people accused could not afford an attorney whom they were expected to pay even if they were found not guilty. The trial began with enormous crowds ringing the courthouse on March 31, 1800. Three transcripts of the trial would eventually be published, one a few hours after the trial by a gentleman of the bar, considered the weakest of the three, a second by James Hardy, who knew no shorthand and had a poor view of the trial, and one by William Coleman, eventually editor of the New York Evening Post. Coleman's, though not without fault, is considered the most complete. In all, over 70 witnesses were called to the stand, and despite public sentiment, the case was far from open and shut. The lawyer for the prosecution was Codwalder Colden, Assistant Attorney General for the First District of New York. There were three judges, Judge John Lansing, the mayor of the city, and a recorder. The first witness for the prosecution was Catherine Ring. The defense succeeded in throwing out anything said to Mrs. Ring by the deceased, including that Elma had told her that she was to be married. 
The prosecution wanted Mrs. Ring to illustrate that Elma was an upbeat girl, not prone to sadness, and to describe her and Levi's courtship. The couple were given considerable privacy, apparently because everyone believed that they were planning on marriage. On the night of her disappearance, Catherine helped Elma with her clothes and saw the borrowed muff that would later be found in the well. She had heard but not seen the pair leave the house. The door, she said, made a jarring noise when it opened, so it was impossible that they had not left together. The pair had left the house at 8 p.m. Levi had returned at 10. He asked Catherine if Elma had gone to bed and wondered why she would have gone out alone. A little after 8, one acquaintance saw Elma in the street, but because the streets were very dark, could not tell who was with her. Colden called several witnesses who had heard cries for mercy and murder from the direction of the well, and others had testified that they'd seen a one-horse sleigh that looked like Levi's brothers between 8 and 9 o'clock. The witnesses only disagreed on whether they had seen two or three people in the sleigh. Colden called for the testimony of an old woman who purportedly heard the week's sleigh leave their yard that night, but her testimony came off as confused, and his medical testimony didn't fare much better. His first medical witness wasn't even a doctor, but a dentist who claimed to have made surgery his area of study. Colden was criticized for that choice, as the dentist hadn't even seen the body until days after it had been pulled out of the well when it was sitting in the street being viewed by hundreds of other onlookers. The prosecution also called Dr. David Hosek, a respected doctor of New York's elite, and the same man who would attend Hamilton after his duel with Burr. Both of these doctors said the wounds that they had seen were most likely caused by strangulation. The defense also called several medical experts, and these doctors had actually been present at the coroner's jury and had seen the body soonest after death. But though the jury had declared a verdict of murder by some person yet unknown, both now testified that they believed the wounds were caused by decomposition in the freezing water, and that Elma had committed suicide. The prosecution did not challenge this incongruity. Those were not the only mistakes the prosecution made. One witness only said that he knew nothing about this affair, to my knowledge. The three boys who had found the muff were declared incompetent, as they did not know what an oath was. Richard Croucher's testimony was also considered poor. One contemporary said Croucher had the mean, down look, which is associated with the timidity of guilt. None of this reflected well on Colden's case. He rested his case by citing a book that stressed the value of circumstantial evidence. By comparison, the defense was well-organized and multifaceted. They called to the stand other boarders in the ring boarding house who described Alma as a troubled girl who suffered from melancholy. They brought up a time when she had said that she would not be troubled to drink a bottle of laudanum, which would have killed her, although Catherine Ring insisted that that had been said in jest. Other boarders said that they thought that Levi Weeks was courting other girls as well, and that he wasn't showing any particular attention to Elma. They even tried to accuse Catherine's husband Elias of carrying on an affair with Elma. One of the Ring's neighbors testified he had once heard voices in the front room and a shaking of the bed while Catherine was gone. The witness claimed to have recognized Mr. Ring's voice, but could not identify the second except to imply that it was Elma's. In an odd section of testimony, this witness claimed that he had never seen the room or the bed, but that he knew that the bed was against the wall, as he had seen it placed so. The prosecution seems to have failed to have taken advantage of the muddled testimony. The defense also called Ezra Stableman to the stand, who claimed the sleigh could not have been taken from Ezra's yard, and several other witnesses who claimed the sleigh could not have made it to that well in the dark, notwithstanding the fact that there were actually sleigh marks found at the site. Colden again let this go without comment. The most important witness for the defense was Levi's brother Ezra, who testified that between 8 and 9, Levi had been at his home discussing the next day's business with company, leaving only a scant 20 minutes unaccounted for. Not enough time for Levi to have killed Elma and returned to the boarding house. The defense claimed that Elma had killed herself. They attacked her character, describing her as sad and lonely. They claimed that she often lied about where she went at night. Their doctors seemed more credible than Colden's doctors, and it, it didn't help that the witnesses at the scene disagreed with each other. One, for example, said that the hose on her leg had been torn off, while another said that it simply had a hole in it. Several argued that the collarbone had been broken, but the coroner's jury disagreed. There was one thing, though, upon which all the medical experts did agree. Despite all the rumors, Elma had not been pregnant. The most troubling piece of evidence brought to light in the trial was a single sentence allegedly spoken by Levi after the body had been discovered. When he learned the body had been found, he said, Is it the Manhattan well she was found in? Testimony from witnesses seemed to establish that Levi had not known that the muff had been found, and so onlookers wondered how he had guessed where the body had been discovered. 
The prosecution, however, again said nothing, and Levi himself did not take the stand to explain. The most retold and dramatic part of the trial likely didn't even happen. The transcript a, describes a witness on the stand who said a man had entered his shop to gossip about Levi's guilt. At that point, someone from the defense, it is not written who, held a candle closer to Richard Crutcher's face, and the witness identified him as the man. Later, both Hamilton and Burr would claim credit for this moment, and the story took on a legendary quality. Burr's biographer wrote that Burr held a candelabra to Crutcher's face and cried, Behold the murderer, gentlemen! But Hamilton's son, John Church, wrote that the trial was a Herculean task and that only his father's logical powers could conquer it. In his telling, Hamilton placed candles on either side of the stand as Crutcher testified to fix on him a piercing eye. When the prosecution protested, Hamilton allegedly answered, I have special reasons, reasons that when the real culprit is detected and placed before the court, will be understood. All of that theatricality which was described later was certainly apocryphal, and it all stemmed from a brief moment when Croucher was merely identified as the man who had been spreading rumors. No matter how unlikable or unattractive he was, he was not the murderer. He had an alibi for that night. He'd been at a birthday party among witnesses. By the time the defense read their closing statement, the trial had dragged on for two whole days, much longer than anticipated. The transcript isn't clear, but after some discussion, Judge Lansing chose not to reconvene in the morning to summarize the cases, and instead offered a short speech in which, the public accused, he endorsed the defense to the jury. The court were unanimously of the opinion that the proof was insufficient to warrant a verdict against Levi Weeks. With that instruction, the jury was gone for just five minutes before they returned with the verdict of not guilty. The public was in an uproar. Her murderer yet lives, but let him tremble with horror at the vengeance that inevitably awaits him, said one of the ring's neighbors. Meanwhile, newspapers all over the city praised the balance and fair trial and lauded Levi Weeks as a victim of the mob. The first transcript of the trial, released only hours after the verdict, argued that Levi Weeks' face was one of perfect artlessness where guilt could never have lurked. Elma was described as a trollop. Coleman's report is considered the first attempt following the revolution to make a verbatim report of a criminal trial, and therefore is a landmark in American justice. Coleman disparaged the other two reports for mistakes and omissions, and unlike them, made no commentary on the verdict or on Levi. Somehow this upset Ezra Weeks, who offered Coleman $500 to alter it. Coleman refused, and Ezra then offered to buy out the entire run of the transcript. Coleman answered that he could not be bought for all the money in New York City. This attempt at bribery brings into question the outpouring of support from the newspapers and gives an unsavory appearance to the admissions and mistakes of the other transcripts. In the century since, the story has been told and retold with varying degrees of accuracy. Unfortunately, Elma is often described as promiscuous or even a prostitute. The well, which still exists inside a clothing store at 129 Spring Street in Soho, is believed by some to be haunted by Elma's ghost. Levi Weeks fled New York, eventually settling down in Natchez, Mississippi, where he had a family and designed the Auburn Mansion, now a National Historic Landmark. The Manhattan Well Murder Trial is one of the earliest opportunities to examine the criminal justice system in the United States. In 1800, witnesses were encouraged to tell just a free-flowing narrative from their perspective to be interrupted by both the prosecution and the defense as necessary. This is a, an example of the development of criminal defense attorneys and the right of the accused to competent counsel. Much has changed since in law and precedent, and certainly the collection and presentation of evidence has changed dramatically since, and that might have made a difference in this trial. After Levi Weeks' acquittal, no other suspect was ever seriously identified. Levi Weeks died in Natchez, Mississippi in 1819 at the age of 43. I hope you enjoyed this episode of The History Guy, short snippets of forgotten history between 10 and 15 minutes long. And if you did enjoy, please go ahead and click that thumbs up button. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions for future episodes, please write those in the comment section. I will be happy to personally respond. Be sure to follow The History Guy on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and check out our merchandise on teespring.com. And if you'd like more episodes on forgotten history, all you need to do is subscribe.